On May the 11th, in 1986, a group of teens from an Episcopal high school in Portland, Oregon, gathered about an hour before midnight to start an adventure where they hoped to be at the summit of Mount Hood within 12 hours. Their mission to ascend Mount Hood was part of an adventure program that all sophomores were expected to participate in, and with the amazing scenery and the sense of accomplishment, why wouldn't you? Mount Hood is located in Oregon, and is the fourth highest peak in the Cascade Range. The mountain stands at an impressive 11,249 feet, and has over 1,000 miles of trails to hike. Mount Hood may look familiar to your horror fans, and this is because the Timberland Lodge, located 6,000 feet up Mount Hood, was used as the exterior location for the Overlook Hotel in Stanley Kubrick's film, The Shining, my second favourite film of all time, following Evil Dead 2. The goal was to help kids mature by placing them in a tough atmosphere that demanded problem solving and collaboration. In the months prior to the climb, instructors had taught pupils the technical components of snow climbing. This includes how to step kick an ascent, plunge step a descent, self arrest you on a fall, and give basic first aid in the field. That day at the Timberland Lodge, they loaded up their equipment which included sleeping bags, stoves, first aid kits, helmets and ice axes, and got on the bus ready to start the adventure. There were 20 people in the group, and they were led by a man called Thomas Goman. Goman's group departed from the Timberland Lodge at 3am and were greeted with freezing cold weather. Although the forecast called for a multi-day storm, Goman was confident that the climbing would be completed before the worst of the weather arrived. The ground was covered with deep snow, but the group soldiered on. The trip was approximately six miles. Avalanches, falls, crevices, and weather that can turn terrible in minutes are all obvious dangers that the group faced on the route, but the children trusted Tommy, as he was smart, clever, and loved on campus in general. He was also an experienced mountaineer and ran an advanced climbing team. As dawn came, the weather and visibility remained pleasant. However, a few people began to doubt their decision to continue. Hilary Spray, a student, and her mother Sharon turned back early into the ascent due to Hilary's stomach pain. Soon after, three other members turned back. According to Sharon, Tommy tried to pressure her into staying, but she refused which looking back now was definitely the best decision. Two hours later, the weather worsened, but Goman was still pushing to get to the summit. Summers, one of the guides, was finally able to persuade Goman to alter his mind at around 2 p.m. to turn back. He had gone ahead and discovered the conditions were far too dangerous to continue. At this point, the group were over 11,000 feet high. From here, things went from bad to worse. The storm had arrived, and the winds were strong, harsh, and freezing cold. The first complication arose when Patrick McGuinness, the youngest climber at 15 years old, began to struggle in the cold. His speech became slurred at around 3.30pm, and all he wanted to do was go to sleep. Visibility dropped below 30 feet, and it was impossible to tell the difference between the earth and sky, making every step difficult. The weather was absolutely freezing. McGuinness was then bundled up in the group's sleeping bag, while the students clustered around him. Susan McClave, a senior and seasoned climber, got inside the sleeping bag with him and helped keep him warm. To warm McGuinness up, the group then heated some lemon water, which helped but slowed their descent down. At this point, McClave and Summers took lead, and they carried on with their journey down. It was possible Goman was suffering cognitively, as it appeared the group had been heading down sideways rather than straight down. With evening yet again approaching, Summer constructed a snow cave where the group remained for three harrowing days. It was in the early hours of Tuesday the 13th when rescue teams were informed of trouble on Mount Hood after the group hadn't returned on time. One of the crew members who had been up Mount Hood over 400 times stated that they were the worst weather conditions he had ever seen. The rescue crew began looking, but couldn't find a soul, and didn't know where to search. The blizzard-like conditions meant helicopters were unable to be sent out, and visibility was now at an arm's length. The snow cave that the group had built was only big enough for six people. This meant that the group had to take turns in sitting into it. As dawn broke on Tuesday morning, Summers knew that he had to leave and get help, 
or they would all die. At this point, Goman couldn't even count to ten. Molly Skewer, one of the advanced climbers, went with him. They arrived to Mount Hood Meadows Lodge, a ski resort, about two miles east of the Timberland Lodge, a few hours later, at 9.50am, where they got help. The bodies of three students, outside the snow cave, were discovered by a team of rescuers on Wednesday morning. Avalanche probes were used to find the snow cave, and the team searched for other survivors nearby. Summers went up in a helicopter to offer guidance on where he thought the survivors were, but the crew was removed from this position and redirected. Sadly, the group were later found near the three dead bodies. The snow cave was eventually found on the Wednesday evening. Helicopters rushed to the location, and doctors did all they could, but unfortunately, it was too late. Seven students and two members of staff had died. There were only two survivors. They were Brinton Clark and Giles Thompson, both 15 to 16 years old. Clark spent six weeks in hospital, but made a full recovery, but Giles had to get both of his legs amputated. He stated, I got pretty messed up. I only have one knee now, so that it makes it more interesting for me. Thank God I have at least one knee though. Both now thankfully live a normal life, but the incident will forever be stained into their memory. Although Summers didn't blame anyone except bad luck, an official inquiry was ordered by the school and Goman was principally blamed for neglecting to turn back in the face of poor weather. Families of the seven students who died were offered settlements, and one of the families filed for a wrongful death case in September 1986. The disaster is the second deadliest alpine accident in North American history, trailing only an avalanche that killed 11 people on Mount Rainer in 1981. If you want me to do a video on this, please let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching.